online session. The last two estimations of parameters that we want to explore in this course. The first one is actually the estimation, actually the last three estimations. Estimation of proportions and the other two will be estimation of the difference of means in paired data and estimation of variances. Let's go with estimation of proportions which is actually the most uh, interesting. Let's state the problem. Suppose that x is a Bernoulli random variable and those Bernoulli random variables appear very often in studies and they're also called categorical variables. Actually, Bernoulli random variables are a space of category, are categorical random variables. And categorical random variables categorical RVs take values, numerical values that are nominal and those nominal express category, express class association or property. For example, the most typical example is the Bernoulli random variable where x takes the value 0 or 1 and 0 means failure or have, do not have a property possess a property actually I would say have a property and one is success or have property but I use the word property not as real as the real property but in terms of attribute Now, if we have more than one class, more than one attribute, then x can take various values, 1, 2, 3, 4, depending, whatever, but a finite number. And these numbers correspond to various attributes that are possible within a problem that we want to consider. So categorical variables in that regard are discrete random variables and in their most special case there are Bernoulli random variables. In conclusion, categorical Okay, so let's go back to the Bernoulli random variable or the categorical random variable of two properties. The main problem in what we call proportion is exactly the main parameter of the random variable, which is the probability that x takes the value 1, and that's called p, or the probability of success. And we call it proportion in statistics because 
this P, this probability, represents the proportion of the subjects in the entire population who possess the property that we're interested in. And I can give several examples of these cases. How many are we going to vote for the president in the next coming, in the upcoming, well, in the coming presidential elections? Who among the uh, registered members of the Republican Party do favor? Do favor uh, Mitt Romney. And all of those are random uh, 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 cases, are proportions, basically. And I can actually mention many more. Here I have a book, an interesting book that I will be using from now on. And So examples of proportion estimation. Polling for elections or public opinion. This is the most typical one. Prevalence of a disease. Sensitivity. Of a medical test. Success rate of a pattern classifier, for example, it's an automated diagnostic tool. These, these are all examples where we have to estimate the proportion. And what do we mean? And, and again, we mean by proportion, the probability of success, because the probability of success determines what is the number or what is the proportion of the of those who have the attribute versus those who don't have the attribute among the general, among the targeted population. So, uh, that estimation of proportions is based on the central limit theorem. But primarily it's based by the approximation of binomial probabilities, either by the Poisson or by the normal distribution. And 
Actually, that's a very interesting point, and we have to elaborate a bit. A random sample x1, x2, xn of the of x, which is Bernoulli. Suppose that we have this. Oops, I forgot to write random sample. with proportion P, or probability of success equal to P. So that's my random sample here. The sample average is this sum. And exactly, it's the number of successful outcomes in the end trials. And that is denoted by p hat. And p hat is nothing else but the point estimate of the proportion p. Now, we know the following. Since x is a Bernoulli random variable, x plus 1, x plus 2, x plus n has binomial distribution with probability with parameters n and p. And we know the following. If, if n is big, and p is small, actually very small, then the better of the two approximations of the binomial, uh, let's, then the sum is approximately Poisson distributed. With Poisson lambda equal the lambda of the Poisson, the mean of the Poisson is equal to n times p. Now, if n is sufficiently big, greater than 30, and p is not very small, is well I would say it's it's not small then this one has approximately normal distribution with parameters n times p and standard deviation n times p times 1 minus p. Therefore, the sample average of those So these two extreme, these two basically uh, conditions that we have, uh, different approximations of the binomial uh, by the Poisson or by the normal distribution, have an effect again in the estimation of p. Now the central limit theorem actually tells us. The central limit theorem is distribution agnostic. 
it doesn't matter what the distribution of X is Bernoulli or uh, it's whatever it is. What is important is that as n, as the number of the sample still tends to infinity, X bar will approximate a normal distribution with mean, the mean of the actually let's write it with uh, the mean the mean of x and standard deviation the standard deviation of x divided by the square root of n what is the mean of x x is a binomial uh, is a Bernoulli random variable so the mean of x is equal to p what is the standard deviation of x again this is p times 1 minus p uh, square root so that gives us that x bar which is here what we call p hat has distribution which is approximately normal with mean p and standard deviation this Now, as we have mentioned before in the estimation of the means, what the central limit theorem does not tell us is how, how well, how big n has to be in order for this approximation to be close, indeed close to the normal distribution. And here is why I made this previous comment. If p is very small, if the probability of success is very small, as we for example, we have when we estimate the probability of success, the, pro the sensitivity actually of medical tests, where the sensitivity is 98% or 99%, that's a proportion. In this case, the rate of success is very high, but 1 minus p in this case is very small. Estimation of sensitivity essentially fits this category here. Or if we want to find whether a, uh, a candidate will be elected with a, some significant uh, percentage, well, a, a candidate, at least in our countries, is not, gonna be, uh, is not going to be elected with a probability, with a percentage of, or with a rate of 98%, but probably will have something more reasonable. Uh, close to more or less 50 or 40 percent or 30 percent. So in this case, uh, uh, estimation of proportions of the public of what the public opinion believes about a candidate uh, fits this other category, where n uh, does not have to be very big, but p is not very small either. And in this case, those were the approximations, those were the cases where the binomial was approximated by the normal distribution. In the first case, again, the central limit theorem works. So what we're saying is true in both cases. But if P is very small, It takes probably more to give us a good approximation. by n 
B, comma, Now, if P is not very small, this N greater than or equal than 30 might be a very conservative estimate. Actually, quite conservative. And in the first case, you see that this happens because essentially what we have is that uh, the sum x1 plus x sub n has approximately Poisson distribution and the Poisson distribution is skewed, where in the other case, where we have the approximation of, the bi of a binomial by a normal distribution, the normal distribution is not very skewed. The binomial is not very skewed in the second case. And that's why we have uh, these particular. I, I make it. I'm making this. I am making this particular point. Uh, at, at any rate, what we have to observe is the following criterion. In all cases, n has to be greater than or equal than thirty, and n times p hat and n times 1 minus p hat must be both greater than or equal than 10. Okay, the criterion is originally, in theory, uses n times p and n times 1 minus p, both greater than 10, but since p is the quantity we want to estimate, we use the point estimate instead. Because the point estimate of uh, the the point estimate of p, which is p hat, is a value which is close, so uh, we use that in, for, in practice. So when we examine, when we estimate proportions, the first assumption we have to deal with is x1, x2, x sub n. The data come from a random sample, uh, from a random sample in general. And second, we have to check this assumption. If both are met, then the estimation, the, the confidence interval for P is P hat minus E. E is, uh, we call E, the margin of error. That's the general term for E. And in this case, E is equal to Z of alpha over 2. That's the multiplier. Alpha is the significance level. And 1 minus alpha is called confidence times divided by n. Okay? This is exactly what comes from this approximation of p hat by a normal distribution. I don't have uh, this number. But I approximate this number by its point estimate. So uh, p times 1 minus p divided by the square root of n is approximated by the point estimate. Now, if someone has concerns, and someone wants to be very conservative about the quality, as we say, all the accuracy. Uh,
bear in mind that p hat and 1 minus p hat are both between 0 and 1 and therefore their product is going to be less than or equal than 0.25 so if you really don't like this particular margin of error you can have a more conservative margin of error which is z times alpha over 2 times 0.25 divided by n square root which is actually the multiplier times 0.5 times actually 1 over 2 n that's better right like that so that's a more conservative 1 over the square root of n more conservative margin of error and that actually tells us that the quality of the approximation improves as the square root of n as according actually to 1 over the square root of n okay this is to summarize this is the confidence interval for proportions this is what you can use if you want to use to be more conservative and you have a sufficient big sample because if you don't have a very big sample, then being very conservative doesn't really help. Uh, if you want to be conservative in statistics, that means you have a lot of data. But you don't have very few data. In any case, you need a random sample and a sample size greater than or equal to 30 with n times p hat and n times 1 minus p hat greater than or equal than 10. If you have these three uh, conditions met, then you can use this margin of error, and here is your confidence interval. I will continue now with a, uh, with, actual, with with a nice uh, example. Okay, I got this from the National Institutes of uh, Dependence and Alcohol, of Drug and Alcohol Use. It's, a, it's an institute of the National Institutes of Health. So that institute reported that in, uh, in a sample of 15,810 10th graders in 2003, 58.1% of them uh, stated that they disapprove people who try marijuana. Now, in 2005, these 10th graders were now 12th graders, and 55% of them 55% of a sample of 2,460 12th graders responded in the same way. Let's see what is the true proportion. We're talking about the same group of people, pretty much, because here 10th graders will be, in two years of time, there will be 12th graders, uh, with very few exceptions. So let's see, the, let's estimate the proportion of 10th graders in 2003 that they disapproved of the people who were 18 years or older, 18 years of age or older, who try marijuana even once or twice in their lifetime. So let's see what... that would give us. So we have a random sample because we believe that 
everything that, that the study has been conducted uh, properly to uh, give us a random sample. So we have And what was then? I think N was 15,800. Wow. A big N. And the proportion is given, actually. It says 58.1%. So that's 0.5. Eight, one. Those were the ones who disapproving, who were disapproving the use of marijuana by people who were 18 years of age or older, uh, even the casual use of marijuana. What is the proportion? So X is approved. It's a categorical variable. You see approved or disapprove, you assign to this the value 1, you assign to this the value 0, the use of marijuana, uh, even once or twice by people 18 years or older, actually 18 years or older. So here is a, you see a good example of a categorical random variable. And the probability, what is PP is the proportion Actually, 10th graders, that's the population in 2003. So, 10th graders in 2003 approve or disapprove the use of marijuana even once or twice by people of, uh, of at least 18 years of age. And the proportion of those 10th graders in 2003 who blah, 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 uh, is exactly the probability of success of our random variable taking the value 1. And now we want to find this, to estimate actually, this parameter P, this proportion. So our estimate is p hat Can I apply Can I estimate that's the confidence interval Can I do the estimation what do I need to have of course uh, my my sample is 15800 which is greater than or equal to 30, no wonder. And actually, n times p hat, uh, since both n and uh, they're both, since n is big, they're both greater than or equal than 10. So the assumptions that we require to, in order to uh, use this confidence interval, are met. What is E in this particular case? Okay, uh, I didn't I didn't mention the level of confidence. Let's say that we want a 99% confidence. If we want a 99% confidence, then alpha is 0 
So we need zeta z of 0 0.005 times we have 0.581 times 1 minus 0.5. So let's see what this number is. That multiplier is 2.575. And here we have, let's take, let's grab the calculator. Point five eight one times. And if we do the square root here, uh, of this gives us, so then the calculation, it's 0 0.004. So this comes out to point zero one. So our confidence interval is actually fifty eight point one minus point zero uh excuse me. It's point five eight one minus point zero one and although I used a very high level of confidence you see that this number is 0 0.571 57.1% and this is 0 0.59 so, the final statement that we make. The data allows us to conclude that with a 99% confidence fifty-eight point one percent plus minus point uh, plus minus one percent of the tenth graders in 2003. I'm stating my final conclusion. This approve Actually, uh, if you see, I calculated the x equals 0 here. That's uh, my estimate. <laughs> I'm just uh, uh, 
getting it right now. Um, disapprove the use of marijuana even once or twice by persons of 18 years of age or older. Now let's see what happens when we go to uh, when we go down to uh, something uh, to even less uh, to, to the twelfth grades, when the tenth graders become twelfth uh, graders. Two years later, in two thousand and five. The 10th graders of 2003 are now 12th graders in their majority. And 2,460 of them responded in the same question at a P hat of 55%. So here again I have uh, X is approval or disapproval of use once or twice use of marijuana. by persons or older and if I put the number one now to mean disapproval and one and zero approval the probability that X by 12th graders in 2005. That's my now proportion that I want to estimate. That's my P. And again, you have a big sample, a big random sample. I think it's Two thousand four hundred and sixty, which is of course greater than or equal than thirteen. So we have a random sample. Uh, they actually, if if you look at the study, uh, provide the here. Here I have the actual uh, website. Uh, the, the actual URL where you can find these data. These data explicitly say the way, mention the way they have sampled the population and how they selected the population. So from all of these, if you read, you understand that we have a random sample. I don't want you to go into detail in discussing why we have a random sample, but uh, you need to examine always if you want to see or to question that uh, whether, when you want to see or validate or, or uh, approve uh, a study. And in this case, uh, our P hat is 0 0.55, 55%, you know, P hat went down. The question is whether the opinion has changed. Has P changed? Have the 12th graders now? Two years later, 
uh, or two years after they were 10th graders, have they changed opinions? That's what, what, that's what, that's what we want to assess. P hat is 0.55, and again, you see that n times P hat and n times 1 minus P hat are definitely greater than 10. So I can have my confidence interval of the same type and this type and this time. Again, for the same level of confidence, my margin of error will be Let's do the calculation. And we do the math, and that actually gives us a little bit bigger margin of error. Point zero two six. So the confidence interval is point fifty five minus point this number is point five four seven so that's our confidence interval now if we compare this confidence interval with what we discovered before look the lower bound of the previous confidence interval is 0.571 and the upper bound of this confidence interval is 0.576 they overlap by a little so with 99% confidence we cannot if by comparing the two We cannot conclude with a 99% confidence that less or that that uh, actually uh, what you want to assert that the 12th graders of 2005 are approving our are approving the use of marijuana, even once or twice, blah, 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 by people of eight, at least 18, uh, 18 years of age. Uh, at the higher, actually, are, are approving Well, we can say they are approving because not in the majority they are approving. They, that more of the 12th graders are approving the use that use of marijuana, and they were more uh, stringent, they were more strict when they were 10th graders, the same people two years before. This is exactly what we. Uh, what we would like to conclude. However, if you reduce the level of confidence to 95%, then you can conclude, you can derive that particular conclusion that indeed 
uh, when the 10th graders become 12th graders, they're more accepting, uh, they're more likely to accept the casual use of marijuana by people who are of age, of legal age. And this is about estimation, this is what I had to, about estimation of proportions. Now, I want to make a final point before we close. If a basic assumption about N is that the sample size is less than or equal than 0 0.05 of the population size. And we make this assumption because if we don't make this assumption, the, then we don't have a random sample simply because when, uh, when this, because if, if the sample size is not less than or equal than 5% of the population size, then uh, we violate the assumption of independence when we sample in the, in the entire population. The probability that we will find another one who has the same opinion like the first one we sampled is less. Uh, in this case, we have, the, we have to make the so-called population correction in the margin of error, and this one comes from what we did with the hypergeometric So we replace that factor, the margin of error, with this. So this is, this is an additional multiplier, which is called population correction. Finite or small population correction. A final point, suppose that you want to find the sample size that will give you a certain margin of error. We discussed that before. We said that the biggest, the most conservative margin of error is actually 1 over 2 times the square root of n. So if you want this margin of error, and you know E, you can take this inequality, and from this inequality, you have that uh, So that gives you the best lower bound for the population, for the sample size that will guarantee the desired, uh, a desired margin of error. With this we have estimated, we, we have completed estimation of proportions and I would like now to go to estimation of uh, means of per data. What do we mean by paired data? When do we have paired data? Uh, let's um, let's go here. That's a book that I have.
So let's let's see that example here. That we have. In uh, and if I can blow this up a little bit. Suppose that we want to find if silicon implants allow silicon to go into the blood serum and in this book that I have there was a study that studied 30 patients their plasma silicon was measured before and after the silicon implantation. So when you have the same people measured under two different, in two different time instances, then you have paired data. So what, what mathematically is the case of the paired data? You have X and Y forming this is measurement before and this is measurement after in this case we say that X and Y are paired data. And obviously, X and Y are not independent random variables. So if we have, as in the previous example, X being the plasma silicon level before implantation and Y be the plasma silicon level after implantation, then X and Y are not independent random variables because we measure the silicon plasma uh, level before and after implantation on the same individual. So the fact that we measure on the same individual is the one that violates, that does not allow X and Y to be independent random variables. So here the problem is estimate the difference between the two means. We made it, we, we discussed an estimation of the, of this difference when X and Y are independent. I'm not. So now we want to estimate this when X and Y form a pair. Natural pair of random variables. So in this case, we form the random variable x minus y and we take this to be our random sample, the differences. So we want the differences to form a random sample. We also need to consider the standard deviation, the sample standard deviation of this.
and this is formed by taking the differences in the random sample in the usual way. And now our margin of error can be of two types. Either our margin of error is going to be the sample standard deviation of the difference divided by the square root of n times t of alpha over 2 comma n minus 1 if x minus y has normal distribution if we can assume that no restrictions for for n but if x minus y does not have normal distribution then n must be greater than or equal than 30 and of course instead We just change the multiply. Uh, now, what, when we use the uh, requirement x minus y to be normally distributed, always think of this as slightly relaxed, and better say approximately normally distributed. In other words, if you have n greater than or equal than 30, you don't want a big deviation from normal distribution for your uh, for your test to be for your confidence interval estimation to be valid. So this is exactly what uh, what we use when we have paired data. We use that assumption, or we aim to that assumption. We need n greater than or equal than 30. If faithfully x minus y has normal distribution then we have no restrictions for n the margin of error is very uh, is very uh, is very accurate actually one of the problems in the homework is exactly discussing this problem uh, or talks about this particular problem and you have to see uh, what happens when you have per data versus when you have when you don't have per data, per data. The final estimation I want to talk about is the estimation of the sigma, of the variance. Well, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. Now, to estimate the variance, we need to... Uh, it's not a very easy procedure. It can, it can only be done if x... And so we have to be more accurate. It might see, estimate sigma or, and of course sigma, squ sigma square when x the underlying random variable has normal distribution so uh, this is very very important without this assumption this estimation doesn't work so the population as we say must be normally distributed So, n can be anything because this is the important assumption here. So, once we have this assumption, we don't have any problem with uh, what the sample size is. Of course, the bigger the sample size, the better the approximation is going to be. 
and we must have a random sample from the normally distributed x which is the underlying random variable and then the confidence interval is given by means of the chi-square distribution let's write the confidence interval it's going to be n minus 1 times s square this is the sample variance here that we mentioned before it's not a traditional one here we put this and now that is called left critical point and this is called with the R right critical point and both are critical points of the chi square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom the sample size reduced by 1 how does this distribution look like? Oh, uh, for the level of confidence for, for significance A for significance alpha so let's see what these points are the chi-square distribution would look like this is very skewed especially when the degrees of freedom are small when the degrees of freedom increase then it becomes more symmetric and if the degrees of freedom are many then it becomes approximately equal to a normal distribution this will be the right critical point and this will be somewhere the left critical point and if we uh, draw the critical areas with red uh, with uh, green kind of unorthodox to put critical areas with green the area of this of the green area should be equal to the significance divided by 2 uh, let's write area and of course the other green area here here is 0 So both green areas are equal to alpha over 2 and therefore the area under the curve between the two green is equal to 1 minus alpha which is our confidence and this is exactly how we estimate the variance of course the standard once you have estimated the variance the standard deviation is the square root of the, the variance so to estimate the standard deviation we simply take the same interval we take the square roots of the endpoints of this interval and that gives us an estimate for sigma i'm not going to do any example for this the book has one so uh, i advise you to read that it's not something that i would pay so i would be i will scream that you should know it for that you should adamantly know that 
But it's better if you take that opportunity to familiarize yourself a little bit with the chi-square distribution. Uh, with this, I wish you a happy Easter, and that, of course, uh, completes uh, our confidence interval uh, part of the course. The next thing that we will do is to talk about uh, to talk about hypothesis testing on Tuesday.